So now that we have established your legal authority to conduct weddings and established your business as a legal business entity, let's talk about your physical business environment. This is how you will conduct your business and present yourself to the community as a professional wedding minister. The first thing you will need is an office from which to conduct your business. Many wedding ministers use part of their home as their business office, and there are tax advantages to doing so, as well as the convenience of having your office in your home. If you have a home office, you are entitled to take the expense of running this office as a tax deduction, just as any other business would do. You do this by taking the total area of your home and dividing this by the area of your office. So let's say your home is 1,500 square feet. Your office is 15 feet by 10 feet, or 150 square feet. You would then take 10% of your household expenses as office expenses and use this as a deduction on Schedule C of your tax return. You could take 10% of your electric bill, your heating bill, your water bill, rent, and your internet service as a legitimate deduction. If you do not take itemized deductions, you could also take 10% of the interest, taxes, and insurance on your home as an office expense. As with all other tax matters, you should consult with a tax professional about these deductions. You will need a cell phone. Your wedding ministry may require you to visit homes, churches, and businesses you want to stay in contact with your clients and be available to them. Many wedding ministers use their cell phone number as their business number. Others use their home number or have a separate line in their home for their business. Some telephone companies offer a ringmaster service so that different phone lines ring different ways. Regardless of the method you use, it is important that telephone calls to your wedding ministry be answered properly. Children should not answer your business calls. There should be no background noise such as televisions, barking dogs, or loud music. Such distractions present clients with an unprofessional image of your ministry and cause them to question your professionalism. I also recommend that you have a laptop computer. This will allow you to keep your materials for each wedding organized. It will also allow you to have all materials at your disposal, whether you are at home, at the wedding site, or meeting with the family. There are several companies which offer software for planning weddings. I have provided a link to a web page with detailed reviews of the top 10 providers of wedding software. As you will see, these programs are inexpensive and will save you hours of time trying to negotiate information in different programs. You will notice they are all inexpensive and, in my opinion, well worth the cost. Of course, you can always use Microsoft Office, use Outlook, Word, Project, and Publisher for your various duties, but personally, I find it easier to have everything in one place where they can interact with each other. For those who choose to use Microsoft Office as their primary software, I have prepared an Excel spreadsheet listing the various tasks associated with preparing for and executing a wedding. Send an email to me at opengate, that's O-P-E-N-G-A-T-E, -E, at S-C, that's Sam Charlie, dot R-R, dot com, and I will send it to you. 
you might use this list in your initial meeting with the families of the bride and groom. Making them aware of these tasks and convincing them of your knowledge of the wedding process might be very helpful in convincing them of your expertise and persuading them that you are competent to provide the couple with the wedding of their dreams. If you are affiliated with a local church, you may be able to secure office space there. This may present a more professional environment for your wedding ministry. You may be able to utilize their phone system and even the services of the secretary and other staff. Having such an environment and support system might help you present a more organized and professional image to your clients. But whichever setting you operate your wedding ministry from, you want to project an image of competence and professionalism. I mentioned in the introduction to this unit that we would discuss what constitutes a legal marriage. As a wedding minister, when you sign the marriage license, you are certifying to the government that you have taken precautions to assure that the marriage meets all legal requirements. So taking steps to assure this is simply part of your professional responsibility. In doing so, however, you want to be congenial and avoid any unintentional affront to your prospective clients. Now, as you see on the screen, in order for a marriage to be legal, there must be voluntary consent between two people of legal age who have the capacity to enter into a marriage agreement. So the first thing you will need to do is verify the identity of those to be married. When you sign the marriage license, you are certifying that you have married these two people. You should make a photocopy of the driver's license or other documentation and keep this on file as proof that you have fulfilled this legal obligation. This also provides proof that you have verified that the bride and groom meet the age requirement for marriage. The county clerk may have issued the marriage license, but you are the one who will sign it. Your signature and those of the bride, groom, and witnesses verifies that a legal wedding took place. You want to have documentation of this. You will see on the screen the address of a website listing the legal age of consent for all states. A legal marriage also requires voluntary consent. Notice the statement on the screen. There must be no mistake as to the nature of the union. This is why premarital counseling is so critical. Many people enter into a marriage with misconceptions or a lack of knowledge about the full implications of such a union. Since you want to encourage a long-term marriage, you will be doing the couple and the community a favor by attempting to give the couple a better understanding of their relationship. Notice also the statement that no force must be used upon either party. This is especially important if there is a premarital pregnancy. A person who feels they have to get married will probably not devote a full effort toward its success. There may be feelings of resentment about being forced into an unwanted situation. If this is the case, you should try to address these issues before the ceremony. In order to be married, the bride and groom must be of sound mind and not impaired by drugs or alcohol. If the bride and groom do not meet these requirements, it may be grounds for an annulment of the marriage. In meeting this requirement, you do not need to ask the bride and groom if they are stoned or crazy or stupid.
In the natural course of preparing for the marriage, you will get to know the couple and can use your personal judgment about their suitability for marriage. You might mention to them that they should not overindulge on the night before the wedding because you want them to be in good shape for the ceremony. But other than that, no further inquiry is needed. You will also need to determine the status of any previous marriages. If either party has been married before, you will want to verify that the divorce is final, including any applicable waiting periods. You do not want anybody involved in the wedding, including yourself, to be accused of being a party to bigamy. Now, when we talk about previous marriages, we find that the institution of marriage is not as neatly defined as some might think. For example, you may find people who tell you they were in a common law marriage previously. This requires further inquiry. First of all, common law marriages are only recognized in the states shown here. It is not possible to have a common law marriage in any other state. You will also notice that many of these states only recognize common law marriages which were formed before a certain date. In New Hampshire, your common law marriage is not valid until you die. I have provided a link to the website in case you want to do further research. Second, the two people must agree that they are married, live together, and present themselves as husband and wife. Common law marriage generally requires a positive mutual agreement, permanent and exclusive of all others, to enter into a marriage relationship, cohabitation sufficient to warrant a fulfillment of necessary relationship of man and wife, and an assumption of marital duties and obligations. This last phrase comes from Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, 1990. Now the key phrase here is present themselves as husband and wife. This has to be something more tangible than merely telling somebody they are married. For example, opening a joint bank account as Mr. and Mrs. would be an example. So would filing a tax return as married. Signing a lease or mortgage application might also be considered sufficient. In other words, just because a couple lives under the same roof, there is no common law marriage unless they live in a state which recognizes it and present themselves as married in some tangible form. This is true no matter how long the two people have been living together. On the other hand, registering at the Notel Motel as husband and wife probably would not meet the requirement.